Hello everyone, welcome to our Inspiring Thoughts podcast today. We're really, really lucky to have uh, Sir Peter Wunless with us, who's the Chief Executive of the NSPCC. And Peter's here today uh, to talk about authentic leadership. Now, before anyone asks, I have asked Sir Peter today how he'd like to be called, and he said he'd be like to be called Peter. So is that okay with you, Peter? That's absolutely fine, yes. Yeah, great. So uh, can I just say a big thank you for joining us today uh, on our podcast? It's a pleasure. Excellent. So uh, what we've done today as well is um, like uh, our previous podcasts, uh, Peter's had questions sent through to him about authentic leadership. So to give time for preparation, uh, etc. So we're not trying to catch out or anything, but really kind of get those uh, kind of uh, deep, meaningful thoughts from Peter. But before we start, I've had a few questions come in to me already. To um, Peter, would you tell us about your lovely shirts that you <laughs> wear and where they've come from, etc. Because you are renowned for those. <laughs> Yes, well, um, when the lockdown started, um, uh, I, I thought everyone was a bit miserable and they needed cheering up a bit. So I had uh, a really ridiculous, um, loud shirt, which I um, put on and then I posted it on LinkedIn, which is rather kind of po-faced and and serious and just put a kind of caption underneath which said something like you know at least when you're working from home you can wear your favorite clothes Um, and it just massively took off Uh, and uh, people loved it and thought this was great and uh, I think some people took it seriously and imagined that was what I would wear if uh, uh, I ever got the chance to the uh, to the office and um, other people sort of saw it as a joke but um, uh, I thought, well, there's something in this. So each day then for about another 15 or 20 days, because I I do have a reasonably lively wardrobe um, with slightly more tasteful shirts than that one. I wore a different shirt every day and then it started to become a thing. Uh, And uh, people were saying, well, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you're going to post. Uh, And so I said, well, if enough people make enough donations i'll i'll keep going because if i can raise money for the nspcc um uh pretty much anything goes and so for about 60 days the first 60 days of the lockdown i would say i wore a different um outfit um and uh raised uh, quite a bit of money and it has become a thing and now whenever i go somewhere there are real sort of expectations or if i'm having a big kind of all society online call um and i'm not wearing a sufficiently interesting shirt then people let me know about it so it's quite a good um icebreaker in terms of people always having something to um talk to you about i get spotted in in crowds and and, and these sorts of things and then in the run up to Christmas last year, one of our social workers in Grimsby, she challenged me to a sort of festive fashion face off um, and set the whole thing up so that for all the 25 days of Christmas, we each wore a different festive outfit and people could vote for the outfit that they liked best. And again, I think we raised about two and a half thousand pounds um between us and 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 that was lovely because it 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 raised money um lots of people got involved lots of people voted but also it was really nice actually for me to be in daily contact with one of our frontline social workers and seeing what you know she was up to um in and around schools and working with the children in uh uh in Grimsby and I don't think she thought for a minute when she challenged me that I was going to accept the the challenge but um yeah I did and it was a bit it's a bit of fun really and, it, and I, I'm, I'm smiling. So do, shall I ask who won the Christmas challenge? Though? She won. She yeah. won 1410. I mean, I realised um, pretty early on that she was uh, uh, a seriously um, uh, um, ambitious uh, uh, festive fashion dresser and uh, I could see from some of the comments some of her friends were making that this wasn't the first year she'd worn a different Christmas jumper uh, every day of December whereas for me I had quite a few um, lively outfits but not so many festive ones so I was racing around trying to get our corporate partners of one sort or another to send yeah, big borrow and steal across from anybody yeah. so please um, <laughs> 
but it, it it just goes to show one thing I really like there is about connecting is it the position that you're in even like you know the shirts it drew attention and people could connect with you yeah uh, and then colleagues on the front line saying actually do you mind if I challenge uh, how you can connect with people just by having some good fun isn't it as well yeah yeah I mean in, it, in earlier stages of my career people would default to talking to me about football or about cricket yeah. or about when I worked at the lottery it was all about music um, but but these days the first question is nearly always about my shirts or my yeah. jacket or whatever. Yeah, but I I just think it's great to be what I call humanised because yeah. people when they see people in that chief executive position can't always connect, can they? So I I definitely think that that human perspective has has worked out very well. I would say, it, it, and it wasn't without risk, you know, yeah. especially in the first couple of days. You know, there were a couple of remarks from people saying, "Oh, trivialising this serious outbreak of uh, of illness," and what about the nurses on the front line? And all, <laughs> you, know, yeah. you can't please all the people um, all yeah. the time. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And as we started to move uh, forward and about. Would you mind sharing with people about your career history, your career path and how you got to where you are yeah. now? Yeah, so I didn't have a great sort of um, life plan. Um, I started my working life as a civil servant in the Treasury. I sometimes joke that my heart's in the Treasury. Um, and then I spent most of my 20s working in private office for government ministers of, of one sort or another. Um, I moved to the Department for Education um, around about the time that uh, New Labour came in, 1997-98. So that was a really exciting time of education, education, education. And I was the Director of Strategy and Communications um, at that department. And then I was Director of Secondary Education. Um, I left civil service to become the Chief Executive of what was then called the Big Lottery Fund and is now the... National Lotteries Community Fund. So that's a, that's the distributor that re, that that um, dishes out the money raised for good causes by the lottery to charities and community groups. That was a lovely job. I did that for five years, and then I moved to the NSPCC in 2013. So I've been chief executive here now for nearly 10 years. So when you asked me to come and sort of talk about leadership. I still feel like, you know, a young a young lad who is learning so much about leadership um, all the time. Um, and yet I've been a chief executive now for longer than any other job I've ever had in my life, which is ludicrous. Um, but there we are. If you've been doing it for 15 years, the least you can do, I think, increasingly, I feel, is to share some of those stories and insights with yeah. Um, other people who are earlier in their leadership journey. So um, it's not a natural place for me to be, to be pontificating about leadership. I feel a little bit of a, a fraud. Um, on the other hand, um, I've uh, experienced quite a lot of it. So, yeah. And um, a lot of people, when I, I ask them to talk about their own personal perspective, they very very humble like yourself to go actually um but if you think about your career you've taken some kind of quite large moves to get to where you are um how did you kind of your thought process or going through to move those career ladders what what mm -hmm. drove you to move on to those positions or to go further um being interested in things really and feeling that i could make a difference. So I was fascinated by politics and government and being at the kind of centre of government and decision making was uh, exciting, intellectually stimulating. I was working with um, uh, clever people. Um, as I sort of moved across into um, education, I got increasingly interested in the, the relationship between policy development and communications and marketing and increasingly felt saw this kind of disconnect between people who are developing policies and then they would go wrong and they'd say that they were communicated wrongly and communicators who'd yeah. say well if we were creating a policy we would never have created that mess that you've yeah. sort of come up with so 
bringing those two disciplines together, I got really interested in. I became a father shortly after becoming a director at the Department for Education. And all of a sudden, um, the kind of game of politics was so much more important than um, just making decisions. Uh, there were children and young people's lives at stake, including and, the, and their futures, including my own um, son. Um, uh, I, the, the reason I got into um, then move, sort of moved to the lottery was I, I remember going uh, as a director of uh, education to see an after school club in North London, which was being put on and funded by a philanthropist um, on teaching kids um, public speaking skills and, 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 and debating skills. And this was one of the very early academy schools in um, uh, in a challenging part of of North London. And as a consequence of this um, donation and this scheme, there were kids who never came to school in the day who were coming in after school in order to learn um, uh, public speaking. They found the lessons exciting, useful. They were channeling their kind of presence and aggression into a skill which was actually rather useful when it came to job interviews and this and this sort of thing. Most of these kids were um, big black blokes from the I say, uh, from the from the local uh, estates. And um, yet there was nothing they, they were trying to save this after school club. And there was nothing I could do as the director to support it. We were channeling our money from the government for very understandable and logical reasons into literacy programs, numeracy programs that were more um, directly connected to helping kids pass their GCSE English and maths. Now, you know, the fact is that if the kids aren't in school, they're not going to pass the exams. And this was giving them a real employability skill. Nevertheless, for the sort of logical government reasons, um, I wasn't going to be able to support this club. And then around about that time, some headhunters were saying, have you thought about this job at the big lottery fund, which was supporting loads and loads of charity and community groups that start with the realities of people's lives, as opposed to starting with the kind of intellectual frame for developing and designing national systems and I and so the reason I kind of moved out there was just a sort of sense that I felt like I wanted to get closer to um, the realities of the lives of particularly people who were finding life challenging yeah. um, and the lottery was an amazing place to um, associate with and support incredibly talented and innovative and interesting charities and community groups to do things which wouldn't otherwise happen and that was the beauty of the job and it was also the limitation of the job because you were always helping other people to do things as opposed to doing it your yourself so I certainly learned a lot about leadership in that role because that was my first job as a, a chief executive and the opportunity to shape the values and the behaviours of an organisation and not just the kind of task based strategy. I just enjoyed so much. And it was a whole new dimension to leadership that I was never able to develop properly as a civil servant. So that combination of values based leadership plus wanting to get closer to helping really life changing things happen for people who deserve better and wouldn't otherwise see that benefit occurring led me from the lottery out to the NSPCC which is where I've been ever since. And I love the point there where you, you first of all I could see your passion about helping and kind of really interested of kind of ground roots to really help um, people develop and shape their lives um, yeah. but I love the bit there where you, you said about also values putting forward because I talk to people about values and companies and organizations and if people can really click their values people follow it's much more harmonious place it's more engaging it's more productive it's more creative yeah. but it's amazing how many organizations still go 
we'll play at values as though it's a task or a tick box rather than living or breathing them. I find that fascinating. Yeah, they're missing a, missing a trick. Definitely, it's so so important how you do things as well as what you do, and creating those kind of conditions for people to flourish is a for me a, a fascinating part of of leadership. And I wouldn't say you know it's come naturally and it has uh, it has grown increasingly important i think through the lockdown and and beyond so you know if i'm super critical of my leadership of the nspcc up to um uh lockdown i would i, I talk a lot now about the charity being chill And we're very fortunate at the NSPCC in that our mission, our purpose is so inspiring to yeah. prevent all cruelty to children. And we can trade on that really strong brand and mission and draw people towards us and inspire people to work really hard and purposefully to make things better for children than would otherwise be the case. So that's the kind of children mission part. Money really matters at the NSPCC because over 90% of our money comes from voluntary donations of one kind or another. So if we aren't concentrating all the time on where the money is coming from, we can't make the difference we need to make. And then people are in the middle. And the bit I would be perhaps critical of myself about is that because the mission is so strong and 10 years growing up in the Treasury and my dad knowing the price of everything and the value of nothing, you know, that kind of the money really matters to me. And if and the people can be squeezed in the middle of all of that. Suddenly in, in, in lockdown, we had to also to manage the multiple complexities of people's working context and ask ourselves and one another how in these circumstances can we be the very best version of ourselves we can be and how can we be the very best we can be for one another in order that we can translate the money into the mission so children still come first it's still children people money but i think my leadership and the nspcc is much more deliberative about that people-based stuff, perhaps than we might have um, needed to be or chosen to be um, in the past. And as a consequence, I think we are, I feel like our culture is more positive. You know, our engagement scores in staff and volunteer surveys are all going in the right direction um, quite quickly. And I'm not saying we've got it all cracked, but by um, talking more consciously and purposefully about people in the context of the mission we need to achieve and making the most of the money that is being entrusted to us. I think that's a pretty um, pretty good recipe for success. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also the bit there about clear clarity, isn't it? About the three parts of the mission, the people and the money that people can relate to and grab hold of and go, actually, that's quite clear and transparent. We get where actually NSPCC are going it's very rather than actually you know 12 mission statements it's very clear and passionate you go right I could connect to why we're yeah. doing these things yeah yeah simple simple yes. stories are yeah. important and you could say the same yeah. about our strategy you know one of the hardest it's a simple it's a really simple enduring mission to prevent cruelty to children it's been the same yeah. since 1884 um, but the strength of the organisation comes from redefining and refining the purpose to, re to be relevant to the times that, yeah. that you are in. So um, at the moment, again, another three, you know, we have three things which we're based on kind of research. We are determined and clear that we are um, distinctly best placed to deliver. So one is everyone can play a part in keeping children safe. One is the online world should be as safe as the offline world. And one is that children should be able to speak up and be heard and, and understood. And that's it. That's what that's what we're concentrating on. And yeah. we can keep coming back to. And again, if you've got a kind of simple story and shared purpose and understanding of what you're working on at 
the present time. Between great, really great and amazing things that yeah. we could be doing for children. Yeah. But I think um, the bit for me is back, everything, keeping it simple, clear, transparent, people could connect to is really, really important as an organisation. Um, and as we delve into the questions now, when when you were growing up, who yeah. inspired you, Peter? Who was your inspiration as you were growing up? Um, well, one person who really inspired me was my granddad. Um, he, I was, he, he had moved down from uh, Liverpool, uh, where he had, he was a small businessman. He, he'd run a little shoe shop, and he'd been the mayor of Crosby um, and the chair of the Chamber of Commerce. And these sorts of things didn't mean anything too much to me. But, but he was wise, and he was a sort of small business entrepreneur type person. And we lived on a housing estate where I used to deliver the newspapers and um, back in the day you'll remember um, the times and the guardian and the financial times had big pages yeah. um, and the and the telegraph still does yeah. and everything else was sort of uh, tabloids but um, my my granddad took the times which was very rare on our housing estate and this was a sign of being very distinguished I think that he had a big page newspaper which wasn't the the Daily Telegraph. So he was fascinated by politics. Um, I used to stay up with him when there was a general election, you know, and we watched the results through the the night. And my nan would serve us ginger beer on the hostess trolley and uh, and this sort of thing. So so he was. I really looked up to him because I thought he had, you know, he'd left school at twelve or whatever. He'd fought in the Second World War. Or he'd um, been the mayor of his town and uh, been this sort of successful small business person so so pro probably him i mean we say at the nspcc childhood shapes who you become and my mum and dad were both a big influence in different ways I and mean, my mum had a really really strong sense of moral values mm. and a uh, huge frustration to me when i was growing up because i was constantly thinking what would my mum think of this or that instead of enjoying myself um and um she died when i was fairly young so she never saw me do jobs like this but i think about her all the time now in a way i never did when um uh, when i was growing up i've got a lot to thank her for which sadly i never really did thank her for and my dad was a music teacher at the at the local school and he was just very passionate about music and very passionate about cricket and those are my two big yeah interests beyond work and they've um shaped me too so probably and you know more than anyone else really um i looked to my family without yeah. thinking or realizing that's what i was doing at the time yeah and it's um and i can replicate that as well so my mum was a very strong influence uh in how kind of i've grown up and my brother have grown up about morals and values uh, and also about integrity but if you say you're going to do something do it mm. and do it with the best that you can do and your ability um and i've quoted a phrase before that my mum would always say it's not the problem that's the problem it's how you solve the problem so she would always be forward thinking rather than always blaming a problem which i you know inspired a lot of growth and forward thinking from my approach as well so it, it goes to show that families yeah. do and parents do yeah. a big part of our yeah. lives uh, my mum was a huge worrier she was and she's always on the side of the underdog uh and uh she she, she i think those are both hugely limiting um uh, factors on how she lived um her, her life so it funnily enough i've tried um not always to default back to the i i clearly in in this job something about the vulnerable and the weak and helping people is uh is important but i i felt that she sort of got stuck there um sometimes and she always had the weight of the world on her shoulders and and trying to solve things which were just so far beyond her ability to solve that she spent too much time um <laughs> worrying yeah. as opposed to getting on with things yeah yeah, pro yeah 
but there we are. And how would you describe your, so if, if an alien landed or someone that didn't know you, mm. how would you describe your uh, leadership style, Peter? Um, I, I like to think that it is um, warm and engaging and inclusive. I think of myself as a, uh, as an um, open, accessible um, person. But I have learned over time that, uh, particularly in larger organisations, there are some people that can and cho- can and will take advantage of that more than others. Um, and they're be- because of the nature of the business, there are certain bits of the organisation that I will be closer to than than others. So I've tried to get more, um, again, deliberative um, about that. So I think about my. Um, accessibility and try and plan for it to be available on a reasonably consistent basis yeah. across um, all bits of the organization um, at all levels so that 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 takes some work but yeah that's that's probably how yeah. I would yeah. um, describe myself I think of myself as a problem solver and also um, I really enjoy building unlikely coalitions so finding group the the only thing that unites some of the kind of individuals and companies that associate with the nspcc is our charitable purpose um and so to find the common ground um across people and organizations that think very differently um is something that i uh enjoy doing as well so probably a sort of team builder facilitator yeah, and it, and the points go back to I I really like the bit where you said about being warm because that's that's a really lovely trait to have, isn't it? About what to show warmth and caring and genuine for people. Uh, I I think that's a lovely trait, and I think the bit where you did that self reflection of being too accessible, yeah, then people can take advantage. Whereas you've done some good self reflection and said, how do I make myself accessible but in the right way? If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, when, when I when I started doing media training, uh, uh, one of the media trainers said to me, "You you 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 have a natural warmth, and that's helpful for yeah. media." Well, thank goodness, because you know, <laughs> I wonder what it's like when they say you have a natural kind of uh, aggression. Yeah. Or uh, um, I don't know if if you're going to be something. Why not yeah. be warm? You know, yeah. another thing I've learned is that in all sorts of situations, you know, you can bring energy to a room or you can suck energy out. So however I'm feeling, I'm going to project warmth and engagement and interest because, you know, why not? Yeah. Well, and, and that's the bit of um, I always believe that life is short. So we've got to make the most of it. Mm. Um, and I always believe that you can walk into a room, doesn't matter if it's business, family, whatever it is, you can pick up the energy of that room of people. So you can lead it to make it in a good environment and smile and warmth and happy. Or you could, what I call kryptonite, mm. so from Superman, yeah. drag that powerful energy out. And it could be a really horrible experience, couldn't it? So I think actually going on the the latter of that positive experience brings warmth and brings yeah. people together, doesn't it? definitely without and without being kind of naive or pollyannaish uh, yeah. about it the issues are still the issues um yes. you 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 want to be challenged i have no difficulty asking or hearing you know challenging questions of one kind or another but um there's no um you can only gain by being kind yeah. and warm to all those around you I think really yeah no I, I totally agree I absolutely totally agree and what would you describe as the best kind of key traits you would see as in leadership the you know best three key traits you would see um clarity yeah uh appropriate positivity so I say yeah. say positivity without poly being Pollyanna uh and um uh, 
purpose. Uh, maybe that's the same as clarity. I don't know, but um, we've done quite a lot as a t- senior leadership team at NSPCC about being clear, positive, and united. Yeah, uh, those are things which we decided together were um, attributes which we wanted to um, project and be judged against. Yeah. And and we had a go at that for a year before we told anyone that was what we were trying to do. And that right. that was interesting because so be, being judged by your actions rather than your words, I think, is yeah. so much more challenging, yeah. uh, isn't it? But yeah, so that's a bit of a mantra for me. Clear, positive, united. And I, I like the um, part there of trying something before going public if that makes sense of behind the scenes with your senior management team, trying those three parts and then declaring it to see how people can see those actions. Um, And I love the bit about being united because if there are cracks in the team, it does show. Whereas actually, if you can show united front through the good times and the bad times, so not being Pollyanna with that part, but saying actually these things are going to be tough, but how do we come together as a team? Yeah. Because I've always noticed over the years that whatever a senior leadership person says, it's magnified by 10 or 15 that it could either be positive or it could be taken in the wrong way of super bad, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And if you, as I think you should, recruit to teams to create diversity, yeah. uh, not just of characteristics, but of perspectives and ways of thinking then that makes becoming united you don't start united but when you leave the room you're united there's some matthew saeed's written some really good stuff about this hasn't he um well recently about it's not as comfortable um to have um teams like that you don't always feel as united as in some groups where you all think the same and cheer um you know for the same team without without thinking about it yet you're you're united but you're not united towards the purpose in quite the same way as a team that has got the diversity of perspective has argued pretty fundamentally about these things come to a conclusion that is um uh optimized for the situation as opposed to being the right answer versus the wrong answer um uh that's a that's a strong place to be yeah and and it's a bit like if you took a mountain the what you've said there about diversity of thoughts is everyone's going around the mountain differently to get to the top so there's different change of thoughts rather than just Mm. everyone agreeing the one way the one route yeah and if that falls it falls doesn't it whereas having that diverse of thinking uh, and the other bit which I find really interesting. Conflict's okay. Conflict yeah. happens in every workforce, but we've got to get kind of get that that myth that conflict's bad because you can have destructive conflict, which is bad, or constructive conflict, which creates that curiosity and change of thought and creativity. That's really exciting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And you don't all have to like each other. You need to respect each other, yeah. and you can be kind to each other. Um, we don't all have to go out for a drink at the end of the yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the evening. Um, yeah. Quite often, if you respect one another, you will do things together. But you don't. Uh, that can that can be a confusion, I think, especially early on when uh, people try to be popular or do the things which, which most people want, as opposed to what is the optimized answer for the purpose yeah. you're seeking to achieve together. Yeah. And in your role, so I'm probably going to ask a $64 million question. Now. Yeah. So how do you handle stress, pressure? How, how, does, it, how does that kind well, of help in your, your role? How do you overcome that, Peter? Well, first of all, I think pressure, there's a difference between pressure and stress. So pressure is inevitable in a role like this. It's not yeah. always comfortable. And sometimes... I have to remind myself that if it was easy, I wouldn't be being employed to do this job and I probably wouldn't be 
choosing to do this job. Um, but you do have to tell yourself that from time to time because it yeah. can be really difficult. So so pressure is good. And if I didn't feel the pressure of being only the 12th ever chief executive of the NSPCC and responsible for this kind of iconic brand, I think something would be wrong with me. Um, stress is much more corrosive, isn't it? So um, if you are um, if you are putting yourself or others under unmanageable or intolerable um, strains which impact on health and well-being, then you're not being the best version of yourself you can be or you're not helping others be the best they can be. So we do a lot here around um, health and well-being and uh, mindfulness and um, uh, creating opportunities for people to talk to one another or seek kind of um, support and uh, assistance opportunities to kind of step away from the um, from the hurly burly. There's increasingly kind of imaginative. Um, techniques and tools which are available through our intranet and our yeah. staff well-being groups and, and 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 that kind of thing to um to help people out myself um i uh i just need to be told from time to time that i'm doing the best i can and yeah. that i'm i'm good at my job and that doesn't mean that I have to be able to solve everything every day before I go to bed. And deep down, I know that I'm trying my best and I can hear my mum saying, just, yeah. you know, do you do, do your best, even though she worried that she was never uh, <laughs> doing the best uh, she could. Or to have someone lasting at night to say, you know, I love you, you're doing a good job. Yeah. That that is really that is really important um and that uh helps me yeah and and, and isn't it nice it doesn't matter what position you, you you're in or seniority to be told you're doing a good job feels good doesn't it yeah just to, just that it doesn't cost a single penny but actually to acknowledge other people to say well done or you're doing a good job goes a long way doesn't it and i've never worked in a place um that says thank you or well done more than the nspcc and yet it's one of the things which we still get told all the time say thank you more give more positive feedback give praise you know we've we've got these um virtual value stars which you can yeah. award to people to say thank you for a task well done yeah. or uh or or whatever and i'm always kind of forgetting to uh to give them out or uh, there's a bit of me this is the my dad my dad's sort of um uh legacy in me say well you know they're being paid to do a job they should get on and do it yeah. you know yeah. what's more important than helping keep children safe you know do you yeah. want, and you want to be thanked for that as well yeah. come on um definitely it doesn't come as naturally um to me as to some people to be constantly yeah. thanking people i do forget um but you're right when someone does it to me it feels good yeah, it does yeah, it does. And it's it's one of those ones about replicating, isn't it? If 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 it's from the seniority down, people follow, don't they? From that perspective. Yeah. And if you were to go back in time, what yeah. if you could change anything or that, what three tips would you give to the younger Peter about leadership <laughs> yeah. or authentic leadership? What you've learned or the power of hindsight? What tips yeah. would you give yourself? Oh, so much. Um first one probably would be don't try to be someone that you're not. So I have been really fortunate in that I have gone into, mostly speaking, jobs that I have really enjoyed um, and, uh, and, and, and flourished in. Um, when I went for the lottery job and when I went for the NSPCC job, the processes were so competitive that by the end of the process, having got the job, I knew for sure that what they were getting was me. Um, and so that was um, reassuring. Um, so I quite often say to people now when they're going to interviews, you know, it's a two way process. 
you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. And if you don't get it, it's not a good fit. Um, you know, yeah. don't don't worry about it. So too many people, I think, spend too much time languishing in jobs because they believe that they need to do those jobs in order to do the next job. And there's quite a lot of that in the uh, in the civil service. At least there used to be people serving time in a grade in order to get to the to the next grade. But if you're serving time, you're not flourishing. And so that's definitely one. Um, second one would, would definitely be to um, be listening all the time and learning as you go and no one's the finished article and I, I I there are times when I was sort of 25 30 when I thought I knew an awful lot more than I think I know now yeah. so that one's important um, and that we've sort of touched on this third one already and um, you're always on display especially the higher you go up an organization so slightest thing that um you say or do even a flippant remark or a kind of frown or a scowl or people pick up on these things and mm. and and spot them and they and they come back to you so yeah those would be my three i think yeah. and it's it's really refreshing to about because it's the same as if i was to go back about being myself i wasn't comfortable in my own skin until about mid 30s that i was kind of a bit of imposter syndrome imposter syndrome etc and then when i suddenly realized who i was and what i wanted to be i loved it really enjoyed it mm. and i could be myself and kind of those things so that's a really good place to be and, and i think that's a really nice bit about the further you go up the ladder the more on show you are so what you say or how you behave yeah. or those kind of things are noticed more and more aren't they so it, it's i mean we we can see and if you took in the political sense it being on show and what happens etc so yeah uh, how did you handle that kind of pressure um peter going or being looked at more and more by people um uh I don't know. I I quite enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> I, I, as the responsibility came, I increasingly felt well. If I've got the responsibility, and I'm on show, then it's not someone else doing it wrong. Which which was a bit of a revelation because, as I say, in my twenties, I was mostly working as private secretaries to various government ministers. And I was serving them the lines and feeding them the opportunity to kind of shine and take the responsibility. And I always imagined that was what um, I would do, the kind of power behind the throne, if you like, rather than being the visible um, face or manifestation. But as I kind of grew into being a chief executive and, as I say, had the opportunity to shape the the values and behaviours of an organisation and what it stands for, then what a privilege and opportunity it is to be that manifestation of the organization yourself and, yeah. and rather me than relying on someone else to do it <laughs> in a slightly um different way so i'm yeah i'm com i'm comfortable with that yeah. i and think I, it's, I in the... some ways it's harder to be a middle manager than to be a senior yeah. leader because you've got to manage all these relationships up and down and across and well that was the bit when i when i was in middle management i found that the hardest because it was like a compass of people above you, people below you, people to the yeah. side. That was hard to, to more stakeholder management, I'd call it, rather yeah. than further up the line, then you had more control or autonomy uh, above. Um, but of course, there are always people above you. I, I used to sort of joke that as I made my way through my career, I always felt that the level above me wasn't required. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, now I have a I'm, I'm not short of accountability. I've got yes. a board of trustees who I need to um, uh, report to. You've got the media, you've got the unions, you've got there's all sorts of yeah. um, uh, uh, legitimate um, factors of accountability which yeah. Um, yeah. help um, keep you on the straight and narrow. Yeah. And it also the, the bit there is I just love the word that when you said it's a privilege, because I think being in a leadership role is a privilege. Mm. Uh, I think you get to see people flourish and develop your coaching, etc. I think it's a wonderful bit to be. Um, and just going on to uh, last couple of questions that I'll ask today. Um, how do you support your colleagues weekly, daily, monthly? How do you support your colleagues, Peter? Uh, um, well, um, 
my closer colleagues, the sort of team, the the home team, the executive board, uh, if you like, um, we uh, connect in together uh, once a week um, just to sort of uh, check in. I have one to ones with each of them uh, in addition to the main sort of leadership and management meetings uh, that uh, that we have. Um, I've referenced the sort of um, the materials and the services and the support that we yeah. have for everyone through our um, uh, intranet. So I think there's an increase, there's an increasing interest among the staff and volunteers themselves about well-being and how we look after one another and appreciate one another. So I, I try to create those conditions and yeah. then participate um yeah. in uh in those uh in those conversations um just as i say being being available um yeah. but being deliberately available so yeah. always remembering that to to make a particular effort to those who are less likely to be um yeah. coming forward with yeah. um how they are feeling yeah and it's it's also like with your time that you've got to kind of allocate, but also the bit going back to what you said earlier about being warmth, genuine, kind, that people are you are accessible to people, but in the right amount. Yeah. To then you've got yeah. your job to do and they've also got their job to do because it, otherwise it can sway the wrong way, if that makes sense. And I think walk walking towards problems um, so that people sense that you're there when yeah. things aren't going as well as they not, might not because you're looking to find the person to blame but because you are yeah. on the side of um seeking to yeah. sort the problem or get to a position where people can sort the problem and stepping yeah. back where things are going better so yeah. you know yeah. taking responsibility for the failure yeah. and sharing the success yeah. is yeah. um a good way to go if you can pull it off yeah yeah and that's the big thing of um hopefully today the podcast doesn't show that it's just easy to do because it's hard no. work isn't it being oh, a leader yeah. is very hard work and we make lots of mistakes yeah um, so the, the last question i've got um on here is um what self-development are you working on for 2023 personal to you well funnily enough um i've just been on the first two days of a four day management development program, which we have put all our managers through. So um, I was really determined that we should have a strong and consistent level of um, knowledge and understanding of the fundamentals of management across the organization as a whole. And um, with the help of our people director, we're all doing the same course. So that has been really interesting because about probably about three or four hundred have been through this now and I'm right towards the end and that was really interesting because in some respects there were aspects of what I did in those two days which I learned 20 years ago 25 years ago but in others the disciplines and the skills are absolutely enduring and the context changes and it is such a powerful thing now when when junior managers in the organization uh, chatting to me and it's not about my shirt it's about the management development program and they find out that we've been on the same course and we've done the same role plays and this sort of thing that's um that has been really good so i'm halfway through that so that so one bit of my self-development is revisiting the fundamentals of of management the other one is um i'm being challenged by the uh by the chair increasingly to um, run the organization without being present so um, not that I'm planning to go anywhere but I have done 10 years at the NSPCC um, this summer so I shouldn't really be um, a personal performer leading yeah. the organization increase increasingly I'm stepping back and building the teams and creating yeah. the momentum and helping create the conditions for people to um uh, uh to problem solve so that's another thing that i'm listening to others about and kind of practicing is um the ability to step out and back from the um from the organization which is quite fortunate because um i am just about to finish my first year of three years as the president of somerset county cricket club yeah. and 
they are my absolute um, first love as a sports team. I am completely obsessed by Somerset, as were my um, mum and dad. And so I don't want to spend large chunks of the summer sitting in the NSPCC Audit and Risk Committee and managing difficult challenges at the NSPCC if Somerset are playing a really important match uh, at Taunton. And happily, you know, the chair is saying to me, you need to be less present in the organisation. Yeah. And uh, yeah. uh, and so so this is this is forcing the issue. If I can yeah. take my time off and yeah. use some of it to further my cricket passion while at the same time practice yeah. leading from slightly further afield, yeah. then everyone's a winner. Yeah. That's and, what and I'm telling myself. Yeah, that's all. and that's that's the bit when you're sitting there, you're going to keep re referring back when you're watching the cricket game. That's what I've been told. To do. <laughs> yeah, it's not me. I've been told to do this. Um, so uh, we're just coming up to the last bit. So, uh, Peter, thank you so much for today. I really appreciate it. And also the honesty and openness about the answers to the questions. Would you just like to say a few words about the NSPCC just to finish up for today? Yeah, sure. So um, as I've mentioned, the NSPCC's um, charitable purpose is to prevent cruelty to children. Um, we run Childline, which is here 24 seven for any child with nowhere else to turn. We run a fabulous um, primary school service called um, Speak Out, Stay Safe, which is in typical times in 90% of primary schools, giving young children the knowledge and understanding as to what's appropriate and inappropriate adult behavior and what to do if you have a worry or concern. We have a website with all sorts of fantastic kind of advice and information for um, uh, parents and adults who want to learn better how to uh, how to keep children safe. And we run some of the most transformational and interesting um, therapeutic services and interventions, particularly to help babies and and, and young children growing up. Uh, under strain or children who've experienced um, sexual abuse, um, not just to help those children, but to demonstrate what is possible so that we can then inspire and influence um, services well beyond the NSPCC itself. So there's a, there's a lot still to be done in terms of child protection. I think Reverend Benjamin War. 1884 when he founded the charity he'd be horrified we were still talking about these issues but then he probably wouldn't have foreseen the internet uh, either so times change risks to children change um but it's it's a really important uh cause it depends overwhelmingly on people's generosity in terms of times and donations and and all the rest of it so um yeah that's us remember the nspcc Look out for the children around you and um, life will be better. Yeah. So, um, Peter, thank you ever so much for that. And I know um, such a worthwhile cause and people can make donations, which is in these, as you said, 90 percent of the funding to go towards. Um, so yeah. I really appreciate um, also you giving up your time today for the podcast um, and just want to wish you kind of the best for your next two days on your management course uh, as well. So that'd be really good and the great to get the feedback. Yeah. But just thank you ever so much for joining the podcast today. And I really appreciate it. Thank you ever so much, Peter. Thank you.